John Dealey on the fifth anniversary of his passing. So whether you are watching us live now on uh, YouTube or watching a recording or here in the Zoom meeting with us, we'd like to welcome you and we thank you for coming. This collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration connects a network of dozens of personalities and organizations coming from various environments and with different profiles, all working in unison towards the advancement and propagation of semiotic studies. <clears throat> Today's presentation is titled Signs and Being, the Role of Semiotics in Heidegger's Thought. It will be delivered by Professor Rocco Gangel. Uh, a commentary will also be offered by Professor Malfata, uh, Malfata Blanc. And I'd also like to mention that after the presentation uh, in the, and the commentary, anyone here uh, participating in Zoom will be welcome as always to share commentaries, uh, insights, and any questions they might have regarding the presentation. That's the main uh, reason we call this the open seminar, because we want to uh, not only spread wisdom, but also um, uh, gain insights and uh, have an open discussion with those who are here with us today. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce Professor Gangle. Rocco Gangle is the uh, author of several books, including uh, Diagrammatic Imminence, Category Theory, and Philosophy published by Edinburgh University Press in 2016. His research focuses on semiotics, diagrammatic logic, French phenomenology, and post-structuralism, as well as the work of Francois Laudwell. He is a professor of philosophy at Indicott College in the United States and a distinguished research fellow with GCAS College in Dublin, Ireland. So, Professor, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture, and I'd like to go ahead and turn over the floor to you at this time. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to begin by, by thanking the organizers of this seminar. It's a wonderful uh, initiative. and. Thanks to those of you who are uh, joining us here, or those of you who are watching this later um, on the on the archive. Um, so, uh, the talk today. Um, let's see if I can. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, basically, has two short uh, kind of prefaces. Uh, looking at the, the poem by Friedrich Holderlin, Mnemosyne, or a fragment of it, um, and then thinking about the sources of Heidegger's somewhat ambiguous relationship to signs and semiotics. Uh, those are, are sort of uh, frames for the talk, which really has two parts. The first part, um, thinking about the ontico-ontological structure of signs, uh, especially in being and time. And then the second part, uh, thinking about the later Heidegger and um, and trying to think about a kind of um, maybe a generalization of the problem of signs uh, in being in time and thinking about something like the sign-like character of being. Uh, and please, as we go through, if my audio uh, has any issues, please uh, feel free to kick in and I can um, maybe take out my video and the audio might improve. Um, so to begin with words from Halderlin, who's a poet uh, dear to Heidegger, and this is a, a segment uh, from a, a draft of a poem that Heidegger himself uh, analyzes uh, in some of his later lectures. Halderlin says, Ein Zeichen sind wir deutungslos, schmerzlos sind wir, und haben fast die Sprache in der Fremde verlor. Um, something like, a sign are we, meaningless, painless are we, and have nearly lost speech in the foreign land. Professor. Yes. Professor, could we please ask you to speak just a bit closer to the microphone, please? Sure. Please. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, 
So to take from these, is that better? Great. Um, to take from these, just these three lines, uh, three uh, kind of signposts um, from Minosune. Um, first of all, the, uh, the very opening line suggests that thinking beings don't merely use signs, but in some sense are signs. That signs constitute our being. They're not merely a tool that we employ. Um, and then in the, the pairing of schmerzlos or painless uh, and deutungslos or meaningless, it seems that in the poem, there's a deep entanglement of meaning and affect. Right? And this is something that's very important for Heidegger, that meaning is not just a cognitive or ideal process, but it, it constitutes us in our most affective and emotional form of being as well. And then finally, um, uh, with respect to the line of the possible loss of language in the foreign land, um, it's important to, to note that language, which is where we are most secure as human beings, especially in our native tongue, we are most comfortable, most at home, and yet reflection on language, as, as all philosophers know, easily turns uncanny. That when we think about what language is and how it works, we immediately find ourselves uh, deeply puzzled. So these are just three um, kind of notes from Holderlin to keep in mind as we, as we work through Heidegger. Um, and I'd just like to emphasize that um, Heidegger was not um, a semiotician. And in fact, he uh, in many ways has an ambiguous relationship to signs. Uh, like other terms in his thought, like mathematics, formal logic, um, especially in the later work, technology. Um, it's often the case that signs appear in Heidegger's work um, primarily in terms of their tendency to limit or obstruct genuine philosophical insight. Um, and on the other hand, themes of language, meaning, and interpretation, the, 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 the very activity of signs remain essential elements constant throughout his, his thinking. Um, so one question we might ask is, why did Heidegger not choose to approach these themes via um, a, a, an investigation into formal semiotics, um, as for example, Peirce did? You know, what, why did Heidegger not pursue the kind of path that, that Peirce did? Uh, and I think one uh, initial answer is that for Heidegger, signs remain one type of being, a subclass of beings, and thus are the subject of a regional science. Um, and what he is aiming for is what he calls fundamental ontology, which would be prior to and grounding of all of the regional sciences. Um, and despite this, I think that a more fundamental approach to semiotics might help to clarify Heidegger's own views. And conversely, uh, I think Heidegger's notion of fundamental ontology might help to deepen, enrich uh, the notion of what semiotics might mean. Uh, and this connection or possible connection between semiotics uh, and Heidegger's thought um, was the, the subject of a study, an early study by the thinker who, under whose aegis we meet in the, the seminar, John Dealey, um, his early book, The Tradition by Heidegger, um, aims to, in some ways, assimilate Heidegger's project of fundamental ontology to the, the Thomist notion of intentional being, or essay intentionale. Um, Dealey writes, subject-object thinking is not adequate to the problematic constituted by questions directly interrogating the ends, the beings, of essay intentionale precisely because intentionality in its proper office is neither a thing in itself nor the modification of something. It is neither a substance nor an accident. And so a substance accident metaphysics would not be appropriate to intentional being. Uh, he goes on to cite um, Jacques Maritain uh, who says intentional being is an existence that does not seal up the thing within the bounds of its nature, but sets it free from them. 
in virtue of that existence, the thing exists in the soul with an existence other than its own existence. And the soul is or becomes the thing with an existence other than its own existence. And so essay intentionale is a strange space where the soul becomes the thing and the thing in some sense changes the soul. And this kind of interchange, uh, I think, and the, and the kind of ecstatic mode in which the relation is in, in a certain sense prior to its terms uh, is very close in spirit to some of Heidegger's analyses. So I think what Dealey wants to do in, in this early book is to suggest a kind of historical and potentially genealogical bridge between Heidegger's project, contemporary semiotics, um, and uh, linked back to medieval um, uh, semiotics and um, uh, theories of intentionality. So, um, what are some possible uh, sources for Heidegger's ambiguous relationship to science? It's his obsession with the themes of how science work, but his resistance to um, the kind of formal semiotics that we see in someone like Peirce. On the one hand, in Heidegger's own background, um, there's a very rich training in both Catholic and Protestant traditions of theological hermeneutics. So the problem of the sign and the problem of interpretation are, are deeply part of his own academic and personal training, figures like Augustine, Luther, uh, Schleiermacher, um, and then specifically um, his habilitation thesis focuses on the, the doctrine of categories and meaning in Duns Scotus. So looking at the, the modisti um, and medieval theories of signification. And although um, Heidegger's theme is, is Scotus, um, later scholarship shows that the, the texts that he's working on actually are, are those of Thomas of Erfurt. But um, uh, there's a you know, nonetheless a, a connection to Scotus um, theories of signs and also Scotus metaphysics and the notion of hexeity um, and the, the attempt to get at the kind of factical um, uh, thisness character of, uh, of existence. Uh, another uh, possible background source is the, the, the ambience of German neo-Kantianism that's there in, um, in the, the 19-teens and 1920s when Heidegger is developing uh, uh, the thoughts of being in time. Uh, Heidegger studied under uh, Heinrich Rickert at Freiburg. Uh, he was uh, in, in direct engagement with Paul Nottorp in Marburg. Um, and I think Heidegger tended to resist the, uh, uh, the idealism of the neo-Kantians neo and he saw neo-Kantianism's relationship to signs as one in which a kind of form content difference comes to over-determine thought. Um, that, that the sign tends to be read um, in the direction of a kind of formal notation and then Heidegger wanted to resist that and, and in many places, Heidegger associates that, that sort of idealist rationalism with what he saw as its mere counterpart, uh, the sort of vitalist irrationalism uh, that he saw in, in figures like Oswald Spengler. So that, 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 that notion of the sign or in Spengler, the symbol was something that Heidegger wanted to resist. And then finally, Heidegger's own um, teacher, Edmund Husserl and Husserl's notion of phenomenology. Um, uh, Husserl in particular tended to understand signs as mere indicators, right? And that um, the, the core notion of intent, uh, intuition in phenomenology is one in which the fulfillment of an intention uh, gives the meaning in person, so to speak, or, or uh, in fulfillment, and a sign would be a kind of empty intention. And so I think Heidegger takes from Husserl a wariness um, of the way that signs can be in a certain sense empty or the way that signs can fail to, um, to do anything other than point to a meaning. So um, 
in thinking about how signs might be approached from the framework of being in time, um, I'd like to think of signs as potentially uh, ordered by ontico ontological structure. And the, the kind of claim or the um, proposal here would be that in the framework of being in time, signs might actually be taken to be an important case of onto, uh, ontico ontological structure, even if Heidegger himself doesn't make that move. Um, and I think to see what's at stake uh, in this kind of proposal, it's very important to distinguish the difference between the ontic and the ontological from the difference of existence and essence, that they are not the same distinction. It's, it's easy to, um, to mistake this. Um, uh, if we take the example, say, of a book, we can, we can quite easily you know, maybe in the course, in the sense of like an introductory philosophy course, we might say, oh, well, here is the existence of the book, but its essence is what it is, right? Its definition, its bookness. Um, but the ontico-ontological structure, the ontic-ontological difference is not as straightforward as existence and essence. We can't just hold up an example of it in the same way. Um, and that is why for Heidegger, there's a methodological determination of human existence, Dasein, as what makes the ontic ontological difference available. There's something special about Dasein that cannot be reached through analysis of a book or any other type of being. So our leading question will be, in what relevant respects might the being of signs be like the being of Dasein? So we might think of two possible methodological paths. The first would be to, to conceive signs as things, signs as beings, um, and this would lead to the notion of a regional science, that we would have semiotics as the science of signs, just as chemistry is the science of um, elements, molecular interactions, and so forth. Um, but an alternate methodological path would be to question the ontico-ontological structure of signs. Uh, in Being in Time, Heidegger aims to ask the question of the meaning of the being of beings. And he thinks that Dasein is appropriately placed to pose this question and to answer it because Dasein has an ontico-ontological structure. And the question is, can we understand signs in a similar mode? Um, early in being in time, um, in, in section two, Heidegger uh, says that in, in asking the question of the meaning of being, we can find a kind of triadic structure at work in the question. There is the defrogtus, which is what is asked about. In the case of um, his question, he's asking about being. There is the befrogtus, which is what is interrogated or what is directly asked which are beings, in this case, this particular being, Dasein, human existence. And then finally, there's the Erfrontis, which is what is to be ascertained or learned about the thing that is asked about. Um, and in this case, one doesn't ask about being, but asks in order to learn about the meaning of being. Um, so at stake here is an essential triadic relation one aims to learn something of something via what is interrogated. And I think that this triadic structure of the question um, has a, a, a deep connection to the triadic form of the sign as analyzed by, for example, Peirce. This way of posing a question, this way of interrogating being, or the meaning, aiming at the meaning of being by way of that particular being, Dasein, um, leads to a mode of phenomenology that's both like and unlike Husserl's phenomenology, organized through the notion of reduction or epoche. It's similar to Husserl in that phenomena are treated essentially in terms of the difference between the appearing of the thing and what appears. The difference between the appearance itself and what appears in the appearance. This, this 
subtle difference um, is going to be the difference that uh, allows things to be understood as phenomena, as things that show themselves from out of themselves. Um, but it will be unlike Husserl's phenomenology in that the thing that is being investigated, being qua being, is in a certain important sense prior to any possible inquiry, cannot become an object of the epoche, cannot become an object of inquiry in the way that particular beings or regions of being can. And this is why um, Heidegger sees the form of interpretation or the hermeneutical circle as intrinsic to the question of being. So in a, a key passage near the beginning of being in time, um, Heidegger makes this point that we can't sort of get uh, in a position where being is an object before us. And that's why uh, our own particular kind of being is both what we are and the method that we must follow. Uh, Heidegger writes, regarding, understanding, and grasping, choosing, gaining access to our constitutive attitudes of inquiry and are thus themselves modes of being of a particular being, of the being we inquirers ourselves in each case are. Thus, to work out the question of being means to make a being, one who questions, transparent in its being. Asking this question as a mode of being of a being is itself essentially determined by what is asked about in it, being. This being, which we ourselves in each case are, and which includes inquiry among the possibilities of its being, we formulate terminologically as Dasein, being there. So Dasein is introduced as almost a kind of technical term in order to engage this methodological entanglement of uh, the one who asks with the thing that is asked about. Uh, so, a very important distinction in being in time is the distinction um, between Zuhandenheit and Vorhandenheit. And we might think of this as a twofold basic relation of human being or Dasein to beings in general. Um, that we relate to everything around us on the one hand through a kind of pragmatics of reference. In other words, we make use of things, uh, we engage beings in terms of how they allow us to engage with other beings on their basis. And this can be um, as simple and straightforward as using a tool. Uh, Heidegger likes the example of, of using a hammer. But I think that the deeper point is that most of the beings that we engage with we engage with not in terms of any kind of conscious relation, but in terms of a kind of unconscious use. For example, all of us right now are breathing air. We are engaging with that particular being, air, but we don't think about it. We use air, and on the basis of being able to breathe, we can speak, we can live, um, but we are primarily using air rather than in any way um, thinking about or or representing what that thing is. So this mode of handiness or Zuhandenheit goes much deeper than just the notion that we use things. It's that an, a, a core aspect of our being is the um, non-reflexive employment of the beings around us in the service of these various projects that we are caught up in. And it's only under special situations or special conditions that things rise to the state of Vorhandenheit or objective presence. And this would be represented um, through a, some kind of semantics, right? When something appears to us and thus has a determinate meaning, a determinate kind of structure of representation. And what Heidegger is at pains to do throughout being in time is to diagnose what he sees as a kind of core philosophical error which is to privilege objective presence, which is only a very, very special mode in which we can relate to beings over and against our primary uh, engagement or relation with beings, which is that of handiness or use. Um, and I think this 
will apply directly to signs. And this is why I think signs can play an important role in being in time, even though that role um, uh, is not as explicit as it could be. Um, the one place where Heidegger deals explicitly with the problem of the sign is in section 17 of Being in Time. And he, he works with one particular example. He gives the, the ontic case of an automobile turn signal, automobiles being relatively new uh, during the, the 1920s. Um, and Heidegger uh, describes this. He said, motor cars are equipped with an adjustable red arrow whose position indicates which direction the car will take, for example, at an intersection. This sign is handy within the world, to Handenheit, uh, in the totality of the context of useful things belonging to vehicles and traffic regulations. As a useful thing, this pointer is constituted by reference. It has the character of in order to, its specific serviceability. It is there in order to indicate. Uh, and I found an advertisement. This is from um, an American car manufacturer uh, from the, the early 1920s. But I think that this is the kind of thing that, that Heidegger is talking about. You can see it's a, a mechanism whereby the, the driver of the car can click um, several settings and then the, the, the pointer on the back of the car indicates either forward, left, right, or stop. So this is a very kind of simple, uh, common picture of a sign as literally a pointer, but a pointer that finds its role in the context of a sophisticated, complex process of getting about in a vehicle in the context of others who are also dealing with traffic and anticipations of driver action and so forth. And so this case actually opens up onto the more general question of um, what, what do signs do and why might they be important? Um, and in this same section, section 17, um, Heidegger has the following sentence, which I think it's important to say is not meant, I believe, as a definition of a sign, right? But this is just a statement about signs. Nonetheless, Heidegger says a sign is something ontically at hand, which as this definite useful thing functions at the same time as something which indicates the ontological structure of handiness, referential totality and worldliness. And this seems to me to be a very, very important sentence because it establishes that a sign has an ontic and an ontological dimension just as Dasein does. A sign is something that is ontically at hand. It is a thing in the world subject to the manipulation um, and representation of Dasein. And yet by its nature as a useful thing that in a, in a certain way exhibits its usefulness, exhibits its, um, its mode of pointing or indicating what it itself not is, is not, that shows or, or manifests the ontological structure, which is handiness in general, utility, uh, and the, the referential totality, which Heidegger um, understands as the, the unity of the world, which is the unity of the referential pragmatic relations among beings as a whole. So every sign, as the specific individual sign that it is, can be understood by Dasein as showing us or making available to us the way in which the world as a whole, the referential totality, is structured. And that would be its ontological aspect. So if the, if the ontic case or example of the sign is the automobile turn signal, I think what Heidegger has shown uh, in the previous slide is that the, the ontic character of a sign, because of its um, directedness towards what it itself is not, its kind of ecstatic difference from its meaning, can be a site of truth. 
And very central to the book being in time is the, the end of division one, which is section 44, Dasein, Disclosiveness and Truth. And here uh, Heidegger wants to critique the, the standard notion of truth as the adequation of the thing and the thought. So Heidegger says, how should the relation between an ideal being and a real thing objectively present be grasped ontologically? And Heidegger responds, what is to be demonstrated, what truth is, is in fact not an agreement of knowing with its object, still less something psychical with something physical, but neither is it an agreement between the contents of consciousness among themselves. What is to be demonstrated is solely the being discovered of the being itself, that being in the how of its discoveredness. So truth is aletheia, uh, unconcealment in the sense of manifestation. Truth is before any kind of um, correct or incorrect linking of two things, it is the showing itself of the thing. Um, and the link to signs uh, might seem like it's getting a little bit lost in the weeds, but it's exactly here that Heidegger links this notion of truth as manifestation or unconcealment, aletheia, with the, the, the direct sheltering of meaning in language, in the signs of language as the, the locus of this kind of disclosure, this kind of truth. As Heidegger says, in the end, it is the business of philosophy to preserve the power of the most elemental words in which Dasein expresses itself and to protect them from being flattened by the common understanding to the point of unintelligibility, which in its turn, functions as a source of illusory problems. And as I'm sure uh, all of the um, uh, viewers for this seminar on semiotics um, are aware, uh, words are just one type, a specific type of sign. Um, and so it, it would be an interesting experiment to take this claim about the power of the most elemental words and try to generalize it. What would it mean to, to, to take the same insight and to think of philosophy as the preservation of the power of the most elemental signs in which Dasein expresses itself. Would that generalization um, uh, give us something philosophically uh, important to, to work with? Um, so in, in his work after Being in Time, uh, which appeared in, uh, in 1927, um, it's, uh, it's often um, understood that Heidegger underwent a kind of turn or kera, and he himself um, uses this kind of language. This is often designated by the difference or the, or the connection between Heidegger I and a, and a Heidegger II. And in this turn, and this, it's ambiguous to what extent this is a change, to what extent is this just a development of ideas that are already implicit in being in time. But in any case, some of the features of this turn are that the historical dimension of Dasein, which is the primary theme of division two of being in time, this takes on a kind of uh, autonomous character that historicity is not just a kind of property or, or um, a characteristic of Dasein, but has a kind of life of its own. It's as if historicity in a certain sense, is, is prior to Dasein, prior to human being, and brings human being into its own being. Um, and alongside that, um, being in, uh, in this later Heidegger is often paired with man or with Dasein as two complementary and equiprimordial terms. Um, so there's, a, I think, a new almost equality of being and Dasein, a complementarity of these terms. Um, importantly, there's a, a kind of shift from the structure of historicity in being in time, which can appear as a certain kind of a priori structure, a kind of transcendental structure characterizing uh, Dasein, 
and, and Heidegger wants to move away from any notion of a kind of idealism or any kind of transcendental a priori. Um, and so we, we might say that, that the, the, the new thinking after the turn is more like a historical transcendentality, that there are something like structural conditions for life and thought, but those themselves are characterized by epochs that are opened um, through uh, these, these sort of beginnings of historical periods. So instead of the epoche of traditional phenomenology, we now have epochs of truth, which are historical epochs. Uh, and Heidegger links these uh, quite strongly to, to language, um, uh, often the notion of a national language, and especially poetry, that the poet, in a certain sense, um, calls these epochs into being. Um, and then that's why he will turn in this, in this later work, especially to um, uh, the poet Holderlin and other German poets. Uh, so here, being is no longer counterpoised to beings, even as their, their truth. Instead, being is more like an event-like world-constituting beginning in and through language. And Heidegger tries to capture this by using the, the old German form of sein with the, with the Y, which is translated with being uh, with a Y. Uh, and Heidegger in, the, in his Beiträge, his contributions, writes, every saying of being is couched in words and namings, which as expressions of being are liable to be misunderstood when taken in the sense of the everyday view. Um, and interestingly, I think characterizing the work of Heidegger too, um, Heidegger says, well, this makes for a kind of stratagem. We now have a new kind of methodology inside of language, inside the signs in and through which we think. This stratagem is one in which within certain limits, we must always accommodate itself or ourselves at first to the ordinary meaning and must proceed in company with that meaning for a while in order then to call up at the right moment an inversion of thinking, the one still under the power of the same word. So here, the difference between inauthenticity and authenticity is made into a kind of temporal structure where one works inside the inauthentic or the, or the common in order at a certain moment, I think in a, in a kind of poetic gesture to flip uh, the, the, the sign so that it, it reveals its ontological dimension. Um, and this, uh, this kind of stratagem is already uh, prefigured in the, um, uh, the myth that Heidegger uses uh, in Being in Time in section 42 of the, the fable of care crossing a river, which takes the, the structure that Heidegger has analyzed in a philosophical mode Zorga or care, he says, well, in a, in a kind of pre-ontological mode, we already see an understanding of Dasein as care in this ancient fable, in this myth. So this, I think, shows there's, there may be more continuity between being in time and the later Heidegger than is sometimes recognized. Um, so in the, in the later work, uh, again, poetry and the, the, the work of the poet comes to the fore in, in, in a certain way, uh, commencing the epoch of a world or recommencing it. Um, Heidegger writes, what keeps things apart in opposition and at the same time joins them together is called by Holderlin intimacy. The attestation of belonging to this intimacy occurs through the creation of a world and through its rise as well through its destruction and decline. The attestation of man's being and thus his authentic fulfillment comes from freedom of decision. Decision takes hold of what is necessary and places itself in the bond of a highest claim. Um, and it's, I think Heidegger is making a very important point here about uh, the power of uh, human historical being to to constitute itself, uh, but especially the focus on the language of decision, 
um, is is very uncomfortably close to um, the the language and thought of national socialism that Heidegger himself um, infamously uh, committed himself to, uh, and that's part of the um, the trepidation with which I think we need to approach all of the thinking of, of Heidegger too. Um, in this um, continued discussion of Holderlin, uh, Heidegger says language is not merely a tool. Again, it's not it's not a kind of just pragmatic um, instrument which man possesses alongside many others. Rather, language first grants the possibility of standing in the midst of the openness of beings. Only where there is language is there world. Only where world holds sway is there history. Language is not a tool at man's disposal but the primal event which disposes of the highest possibility of man's being. Um, and I think the, the kind of poetic heights that Heidegger's language uh, attains in some of these later works often leads to the sense that maybe there's just a kind of mystical um, mumbo jumbo, uh, what, uh, what concretely is being said. Um, and that's why I, I would like to suggest, it's a little bit speculative, um, but that, what Heidegger is aiming to articulate about language as both an event, a commencement, and a kind of transcendental condition of the world might find a formal analog in Peirce with Peirce's system of existential graphs. Uh, this is a system that Peirce developed um, and, and often described as his, uh, his most important contribution to philosophy. Um, on the one hand, it's a, a system of logical notation. Uh, on the left, you can see um, the, the equivalent of uh, a kind of modus tollens setup, uh, something like if P then Q and not Q. Um, and um, and, it, this, and there's, there are different uh, levels where uh, first order logic, different modal logics can be expressed. But if we don't focus on the ability of this notation to express logical relations, one of the most interesting components of the, um, uh, the system in Peirce is the sheet itself. That the, what Peirce calls the sheet of assertion is just the blank space on which different statements are asserted. And the role of the sheet of assertion is fundamental to the logical notation. It itself is a graph. And in fact, it is a graph that takes the value true. So there is a way in which the empty sheet is truth, but it also is the space upon which assertions that are either true or false can be scribed. Uh, and I think that there's something like this, something analogous to this, that Heidegger is trying to articulate by thinking of truth as the ground of the world, right? The ground upon which figures of manifestation can appear, but a ground that is not purely transcendental, but is itself one truth, is itself one commencement or one event. In any case, I'll, I'll leave that as a kind of speculative um, possibility. Um, I think um, more reasonably, um, in the light of Heidegger II, um, it's possible to distinguish at least three distinct possible levels for thinking of the, the term semiotics. Um, we can continue to think of it as a, a regional formal science, right? And we might think here of the, the work of Peirce or in a very different mode, the work of Helmslev. Um, but then, um, a, a, we could say a deeper level might be represented by someone like Heidegger's um, uh, student, uh, Hans Georg Gadamer. Heide uh, Gadamer takes the, the interpretive hermeneutical structure of, um, of being and develops this as a, as a kind of dynamic that is common to all human cultural and philosophical and theological enterprises. So that sign, or semiotics in this sense wouldn't just be uh, something that characterizes certain aspects of the world, but it would be uh, the form of interpretation that is intrinsic to basically all human activity. Uh, and then finally, I think most radically, 
and, and maybe closest to Heidegger's own intent, maybe in the, in the late works, that we might think of semiotics not as a universal dynamic of interpretation, but as the epical forms of life themselves, uh, maybe as, as incommensurable with one another and as historically determinate as the, the tradition or as the form of life, the form of being that various cultures or, um, or uh, human enterprises are. Um, and uh, just to, to conclude, um, I just wanted to indicate how Heidegger's thought continues to influence um, scholarship today through a variety of thinkers who are very important in their own right, thinkers of hermeneutics, such as Gadamer, Paul Ricoeur, uh, Gianni Vattimo, um, the tremendous influence of Heidegger in literary criticism and the tradition of deconstruction coming from Derrida, um, but also figures like the, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, um, and then also uh, the tradition of uh, phenomenological theology that um, Emmanuel Levinas, who's very much at the core of that tradition, um, is a very profound reader and also critic of Heidegger. And out of Levinas's work uh, and its connection to Heidegger, thinkers like Jean-Luc Marion, uh, Michel Henri uh, in the United States, uh, John Caputo have, have thought about theology through the lens of um, Heidegger's conception of being. And I think also in, in a certain sense, his conception of sign. Um, here's some, uh, some bibliography, both from the talk and some suggest suggested uh, secondary literature. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, thank you very much for, for listening and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks so much. Professor Rocco Gengo, thank you so much for this brilliant presentation. It is a honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Now we are going to close the broadcasting on YouTube.